Well, good afternoon, Chair Harrington and Commissioners. Uh, for the record, I'm Josh Kreitz, I'm the Assistant Director of the Housing Department. We're, we're really, really excited to be here with you this afternoon to provide this joint, our first joint quarterly update around our affordable housing bond program and the supportive housing services program. So over the last two years, our housing department budget has really, really increased from 40 million up to 130 million. And if you wanna look at some of the key uh, reasons for that, the two programs that we're gonna discuss today represent a lot of that growth. So we're excited to share the first affordable housing bond project in the county's implementation area, which is the viewfinder. It's our phase one project and that's scheduled to be completed next month. So we're really excited about that. And I think one thing that we want to highlight is Viewfinder is also the first op opportunity that we have here to align our supportive housing services funds with our affordable housing bond funds, as you're going to hear quite a bit about today. So I'm not going to take a lot of time because we have a lot of really good information, but I do want to say that we have a really innovative and collaborative team working in this department. Um, we're looking for ways to collaborate both internally with other departments, Health and Human Services, our Office of Equity, our comms teams, but also externally with our important community partners. And I think because of the unique structure of being the public housing authority, the implementing SHS partner, the implementing Metro Bond uh, implementer, we're really able to think through unique opportunities to leverage these resources together to serve the most vulnerable folks here in Washington County. So we're really excited about that. And we're really excited to bring these resources to bear as quickly as possible while building that base that's really needed. So we're just incredibly proud of the work that's happening right now. Uh, next slide, please. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Shannon. I think we can go ahead and advance it to the next slide and Shannon can get right into the presentation. Thank you. Great, good afternoon, Chair Harrington and Commissioners. So Shannon Wilson, Housing Development Manager. Um, and yes, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, so first, uh, for my part of the presentation, I just wanted to briefly provide context for the affordable housing bond program. Uh, so the Tri-County measure was approved by voters in November of 2018. Uh, from there, it took about a year for each implementing jurisdiction to draft their local implementation strategy and negotiate intergovernmental agreements with Metro. Uh, the county's agreement IGA with Metro uh, was approved by your board and Metro Council in late 2019. And the affordable housing bond brings uh, just under 188.3 million total in capital funds to the three implementing jurisdictions in the county. And so that's uh, the cities of Beaverton, Hillsborough, and then Washington County's implementation area. And the overall unit production goal then associated with those funds uh, is an overall goal of producing 1,316 units of regulated affordable housing in the county. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide gives you the overall uh, pipeline of projects within the county. And so it's broken out by implementation area. Uh, and so I'm going to be focusing on Washington County's implementation area, but I did want you to have this overall uh, portfolio for the county as a whole. Uh, next slide, please. So this chart looks specifically at Washington County's implementation area. Uh, and there in the blue column, you can see the associated Metro bond and county specific goals for the county's implementation area. So as you kind of walk through that, so goals around the total number of units, the number of uh, units for extremely low income households at 30% median family income, a goal around the number of family sized units, and then a goal established by your board in the local implementation strategy around the number of permanent supportive housing units. Uh, and there at the bottom of that column, you can see the total amount of Metro bond funds allocated specific to the county's implementation area of just under 116.5 million. Uh, and then as you move across the chart, you can see the 10 projects that your uh, board has approved. Uh, and then over to the subtotal column, which gets at uh, how those 10 projects uh, come together to help achieve those unit production goals. Uh, and then the final column, uh, which has the remaining number of units uh, to be completed after the, that pipeline, pipeline of projects. And so as you look at that last column, you can see that overall, um, we've nearly met the unit production goal with two units remaining, but we do have some 30% uh, median family income units to build 24 or produce. Uh, and then 11 of those should be family sized units. And so with those remaining funds at 17.2 million, uh, the county is really well positioned to exceed the, these unit production goals uh, that have been established by Metro and your board. 
Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So looking specifically at this uh, quarter that we're reporting on, the July through September period, uh, one of the key activities during that period, uh, as Josh uh, mentioned as well, is the ongoing construction of Viewfinder. Viewfinder is the county's phase one project located in the Tiger Triangle at the intersection of 72nd and Baylor. Uh, it's an 81 unit project and is a partnership between community development partners and the housing authority. Uh, and one of the key features or maybe unique features about this project uh, is all of the art in the building. And so the uh, piece on your slide is just one of the many art pieces that will be throughout the building. Uh, community development partners have commissioned three local artists to produce a variety of pieces, some collage like this, some more photography. Um, and so this piece on your screen is a mural collage that will be featured at the uh, pedestrian entrance to the building. Uh, and one other key activity that occurred during this quarter that's related to the viewfinder is around community engagement uh, that was related to the lease up process for the viewfinder. Uh, so this was really our first opportunity to support an equitable lease up process with an affordable housing bond project. Uh, and so we engaged with culturally specific organizations uh, to really begin to create a model for outreach and education uh, for lease up processes and then also marketing of the, of the projects. So we've been working closely with, uh, uh, with community development partners as well as their property management company uh, and really working to, um, to refine something that we can use on future projects as well. Uh, next slide, please. Another key activity during uh, the, the July through September quarter uh, was a construction start for the Valfrey at Avenida 26. This is a 36 unit project in Forest Grove, uh, closed on its construction loan on July 23rd and began construction shortly thereafter. We did have a uh, more of a groundbreaking photo op um, at the site a few weeks later in August. So there you can see some um, VIPs, I'm sure you recognize there on the slide. Uh, and then some construction photos as well that were taken in, in late September. So as you can see, the, uh, the project is, is well underway. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this slide kind of, um, this map kind of pulls back out to that aerial view and uh, really to reiterate the geographic dispersal of the projects uh, throughout the county. So this includes the projects within Washington County's implementation area. Those are the blue, are the projects identified by a blue uh, marker there on the map. And then those in maroon are two of the city of Beaverton's projects. And then the green is the uh, city of Hillsborough's first affordable housing bond project. Uh, so just to kind of uh, remind us all of the dispersal of the projects throughout the county. Uh, next slide, please. And so I wanted to take a minute too and look as we look at this quarter of July through September, but then also look forward to the uh, fiscal year to see the number of units that will begin construction this fiscal year. Um, so if you start at that kind of the top left square, the July through September, <clears throat> with 36 units, that's the Valfrey that began construction in that quarter. Uh, in this current quarter, we anticipate 198 units begin, beginning construction. Uh, and then in the first quarter of 2022, another 270 units uh, beginning construction. And then April through June, 111 units. So total in this fiscal year, we anticipate 615 units uh, beginning construction. Uh, next slide, please. And so the first of the, or one of those projects uh, that will begin construction this quarter is the Aloha Inn. And so it's actually a conversion, an acquisition rehab project, but it'll begin that conversion work in December. And so this is a 54 unit project in unincorporated Washington County uh, at the intersection of 198th in T and uh, TB Highway. Uh, next slide, please. And then the other project to begin construction this quarter is Terrace Glen. It is 144 units in Tigard, just uh, very close to the Washington Square Mall. And um, this is the largest project currently in the um, county's implementation area portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, I wanted to end my portion of the presentation by um, highlighting four trends that we've seen uh, thus far in implementation of the affordable housing bond. Uh, so the first one is that uh, implementing the housing bond has helped us really leverage a, a previously underutilized source uh, at the state, which is the 4% low-income housing tax credit. 
Uh, and so that has been uh, a big boost for, the, for these projects. Uh, the second trend is that the affordable housing bond has attracted national and multi-state affordable housing developers. Uh, and prior to the affordable housing bond, I mean, we already had a great community of affordable housing developers and very strong. Um, and so the addition of these uh, new coming larger developers has really, uh, has just increased our capacity and helped us better achieve those or more quickly achieve those unit production goals. Um, and then the third trend, which is kind of a counterpoint to the second one, is that the implementation of the housing bond has, has also bolstered community-based nonprofit developers in the county. Um, so there are two developers that are smaller and really based to have the bulk of their portfolios in the county, and that's BNSR and Community Partners for Affordable Housing. Uh, and for both of those, the projects that they have received uh, affordable housing bond awards for, those are the largest projects in their portfolio to date. So, um, so bolstering these community-based nonprofits is really important for the, um, for the communities that they serve, because these are the organizations that really uh, engage with community members as volunteers, as donors, and really connect with their, with their residents as well. Uh, and then the fourth trend is that in implementation of the affordable housing bond, we've really had an opportunity to, um, to really think through and, and operationalize advancing racial equity. And so it's been in contracting during the development process, and then also in community engagement uh, as we engage with culturally specific uh, organizations and, and groups uh, to look at project design, um, layout of, of the buildings and projects. And then as we look at the lease up process to see if they uh, are equitable and that everyone has um, you know, the same access to these units. Uh, and then one other component of advancing equity in general is is looking at how we provide units for those extremely low income households and how we provide uh, permanent supportive housing. Uh, and so that's been um, uh, one of the significant trends as we've been implementing the bond and, and as now we're aligning with the supportive housing services measure. Um, so I wanna thank you for your time and I will now hand it over to Jess Larson to talk about supportive housing. Thank you. Oh, I see the chair has her hand up. <laughs> I thought it might just be worth noted, noting, uh, and by the way, I really appreciate all the information that you have in this work session. I continue to be amazed by our team and the terrific results. <clears throat> in the work session topic sheet, uh, it talks about while Metro does not require a former quarterly report, staff has prepared a weekly update. Uh, I think, um, I know I have asked for further information from our team about our, or some information from our team on a quarterly basis. I did not intend for it to be any sort of additional work or lift, but rather my only way of really following on the journey along the way has been to look at the Metro website with the affordable housing quarterly reports there, where from quarter to quarter, they do talk about Washington County projects. Uh, but in addition, so what really the ask is I have is uh, if there's, uh, I think it would be helpful for us to just be reminded when that quarterly report is available, uh, even if it doesn't have any specific call outs for Metro pro, um, Washington County projects. I know that uh, looking at their May 5th, uh, excuse me, May 3rd, 2021 document, which was the January through March quarterly report, it talked about the Aloha Inn in a little bit more detail than I was familiar with. And, also, just reading about other projects throughout the region and also the kind of information that Metro staff has made sure that oversight committee gets has helped me understand uh, the more of the on the ground work on the ground work that has gone into the community engagement for these various affordable housing solutions throughout our region 
including the racial equity component. So, uh, and the reason that I'm, I'm pausing us here to mention this is because we do have some interactions in our community that get a little bit contentious, you know, not in my backyard or lack of familiarity. And so having access to that information has helped me navigate some of those conversations. And so that's why I just wanted to um, ask for a little bit of help from our staff to just on that once a month, uh, excuse me, once a quarter basis, just remind me to go look over there. Uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit cumbersome to find sometimes, uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, or if you can could include a link just to the Metro Affordable Housing Oversight Committee main page, uh, that would just be helpful. I really appreciate your listening to me and helping me do a better job as a board member. Thank you. And keep up the awesome work. Yay. We, we can do that. We'll make sure you get that. Yes. All right. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Chair and Commissioners. My name is Jess Larson. I'm the Supportive Housing Services Program with part uh, Program Manager with Part Two of your quarterly update on these two really game-changing regional investments that we're um, getting to implement here in Washington County. So I am going to start with um, a brief story. This is Dora. She um, has been staying at our bridge shelter program in Washington County um, ever since her most recent episode of homelessness. And Dora has experienced homelessness intermittently for the last five years to due to a variety of challenges, uh, family challenges, um, housing costs, uh, healthcare challenges. And most recently when her mother passed away, she lost an important part of her um, safety uh, net um, and uh, found uh, and, and lost her housing and, and ended up homeless. And thankfully, uh, uh, through the support of our system of care that we are building out, was able to land at the bridge shelter where she got connected to a case manager. And that case manager has begun working with her on a housing plan, including um, a permanent rent assistance subsidy, which will make her limited disability income um, reach the cost of monthly rent, if you will and uh, is set to move into her home this month. And so I wanted to start this story off, Doris, uh, start us off with Dora's story because those components, those three pieces of, of shelter, case manager and rent assistance equaling home is the story of what supportive housing services program is designed to do for people who struggle with dis disabling conditions and experience repeated homelessness in our community. And so Dora's story is one of what we hope to be 499 more households placed into permanent supportive housing through this first year of programmatic implementation. And I thought it was also a helpful depiction of the, how we are intentionally building out our system of care to bring these components um, to bear in our community, adequately scaled to meet the need and strategically working together to help connect people from one point in the system to the next, to the next until they find that housing stability because both that rent assistance and that case manager will continue to support Dora in her um, new home as the supportive housing services program is designed to do. Okay, so with that um, introduction, let me jump into the presentation. Next slide, please. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to see our quarterly report. It's uh, been prepared representing the last three months of work well underway in implementation of the SHS program, our first quarterly report. Um, these are the six chapters, if you will, of that report. And I will go through just a high level overview of each of those elements in the quarterly report. You'll um, need to kind of take the time to get into the report to get the full detail. We don't have enough time with you today. Um, and also before I launch into sort of that high level overview of um, our programmatic implementation so far, I wanted to pause and thank and acknowledge the Supportive Housing Services team. Um, really, I am here just representing the enormous amount of work that they have been leading in building out this system of care with this new Supportive Housing Services 
program. So uh, just a quick shout out to my colleagues on the team, Heather Scriver, Alex Devin, Pernice Strub, Janine Smith, Ty Schwefferman, Ali Alexander Sheridan, Stacey Williams, Zoe Johnson, and Austin Saldana. It takes a big, strong team to do this new work. And I'm so grateful for these colleagues who joined us in Washington County to help build and launch this program. Um, so hopefully you'll get to meet them soon in a, in a future presentation. But for today's uh, sake of expediency, I will carry on and represent their work here for you today. Next slide, please. <clears throat> So you've heard lots about our bridge shelter programs. Um, that is one of the foundational building blocks in our SHS program that we've begun. We uh, now have three bridge shelter programs operating in Washington County um, at the Hillsboro, the, the um, former Econo Lodge site and the Aloha Inn, which Shannon was just mentioned mentioning will become our first all 100% PSH programs, permanent supportive housing um, in the near future. And um, uh, Forest Grove Inn has been purchased by Central Cultural and now has been named the Casa de Amparo and is operating also as a, a, a bridge shelter program. And what bridge shelter means is it's a housing focused shelter program. It connects people to case managers, those rent assistance tools, whatever it takes to help them achieve that permanent housing uh, placement and the stability they need to hopefully never experience homelessness again. So there's a lot of support that goes into these programs so that it is the end of homelessness and the beginning of housing stability for everyone who moves through these programs. And to date, we have 102 of these um, new shelter rooms in operation, which achieves our year one expanded shelter capacity goal for the supportive housing services program. Next slide, please. Another major foundational component of building out the system of care has been our housing case management program. <clears throat> I might take a minute to describe how this all works. So, so far there are 17 organizations who've entered into contract with the Supportive Housing Services Program to implement a, a new housing case management program. Each of them are hiring between two and three case managers and getting them trained up and ready to go to be the boots on the ground to work with people from any point in homelessness to housing navigation, to uh, securing that apartment and then ongoing housing retention that all in wraparound support of a case manager. They each work with 20 to 30 households. Um, and uh, again, they do whatever it takes to achieve and sustain housing stability. And with this investment of the 17 organizations and the two to three case managers and the 20 to 30 participants per case manager, we have uh, launched a capacity for 800 households to be served with permanent supportive housing through case management. And our goal is, as you may recall, 500 placements in year one. So this is a foundational program that will help us to achieve that goal. <clears throat> And working right alongside of the housing case management program is another very important um, first kind of building block of our SHS system of care, which is the regional long-term rent assistance program. This is a local uh, rent assistance subsidy mirrored and built on the best practices of the federal rent assistance system and um, will be that tool that buys down the rent to make sure it's affordable for households with extremely low incomes as often is the case for the people we're serving who experience prolonged homelessness. So every one of the households served in the housing case management program is paired with a rent assistance um, subsidy to help make sure that housing is permanently affordable for them. Next slide, please. Now I'm gonna move into another layer of investments. Those were some of our programs in the first quarter. Here are some of our systemic and equity investments we're making to pair with those programmatic investments. It's chapter two, if you will, of the, um, of the quarterly report. <clears throat> And again, just at a very high level, as we committed in our local implementation, we are moving plan in our local implementation plan. We are moving forward with uh, investments in culturally specific organizations to build up their capacity to deliver more culturally specific services to our community. So for all of the uh, culturally specific organizations that have so far signed on to contract with us, we've committed an additional $50,000 per year for three years as capacity building uh, 
to support their administrative or organizational needs so that they can both deliver this program and grow to deliver more services in our community. We've also built a training program for all of those new boots on the ground uh, that are getting hired up by all the case manager um, partners and the shelter partners. Um, all of this, these new housing staff members need to get um, sturdy training <laughs> under their feet to, to go out and do this work, including behavioral health, kind of 101 trainings, culturally um, and trauma-informed care, housing navigation 101. Um, there's a long list of training programs and it will be available on an online portal. So whenever a new housing case manager gets hired, they can go and get themselves set up with the training um, program that they need. And these programs or the training program will be offered on a quarterly basis to keep our new um, um, fleet of housing case managers and shelter providers fully trained um, in the work that they're doing. We've also really um, been thoughtful about how to procure these services. So we've conducted an RFPQ, which you may recall from earlier this spring, that's a request for programmatic qualifications, which qualified 38 organizations, many of whom are already contracting with us to provide some of these new programs and services. Um, and that process was heralded as a very inclusive and accessible process to many of the service providers such that Washington, or, uh, that Clackamas and Multnomah counties have asked us to convene the next process as a tri-county coordinated event. So we're very honored by um, that um, high praise and looking forward to continuing the use of this, infra this infrastructure, if you will, so that we can make con uh, contracting with governments more accessible and uh, widely available to these important service provider organizations in our community. Last but not least in this chapter is a mention of our Community Connect modernization. That, if you may recall, is our required coordinated entry system required by HUD for all homeless services um, continuum of cares. And it is the tool that sort of um, tracks everyone's referral into the system and referral to other services. And as you know well, our system has had very little resources to meet the need in our community. And our Community Connect structure had um, been designed to manage a system of scarcity. And anticipating this robust investment, we needed to redesign it to help people collect, connect efficiently and effectively to the housing programs and case managers who are going to help them. So we've trained scores, more assessors, and we've reduced the assessment from about an hour plus long phone call to a 20 minute conversation that quickly connects people to the next step in the work. And um, this has also been <laughs> heralded as great success by our service providers who are very happy to be using this tool now in our community when they're working with people in need. So those are some of the systems and equity investments so far underway in our first quarter. Next slide. Um, this slide um, demonstrates the um, outcomes reporting that we will need to do for the regional report every quarter and every, every year, and how we will generally at a high level track our investments and our impact, the efficacy of our supportive housing services program. So I will walk you by, um, through each of these metrics one by one, and I'll uh, ask the uh, clerk Moss to help forward the slide. Each, the slide has um, several steps in it. So program and infl uh, inflow and outflow. Here is an example of how that metric is measured. In the last quarter, 843 households were assessed through Community Connect, 278 were assisted, however 393 ex exited without help and 172 continue to wait. This is a demonstration of our system of scarcity that we have here in Washington County before SHS investments. Um, and in many ways, the outcomes from this quarter represent that kind of baseline from which we are building upon with these new investments. So this is what we hope to be um, correcting in future quarters, that the number of those assisted significantly increases and the numbers of those waiting or unhelped significantly decreases. Um, the next uh, metric is system capacity. One way in which we measure that is through the number of supportive housing placements we have in our system. 
And right now we have 394 supportive housing placements, but our data tells us that 885 households need this kind of supportive housing um, service now in our community. And that's why our goal, that's part of the reason why our goal is 500 in the first year. We want to significantly scale up and meet that need. So again, we hope you see progress in this metric report in our future, um, future quarterly reporting. Next slide is the actual number, or sorry, next metric, the actual number of housing placements made in the last year. There are many kinds of housing placements, but I just wanted to highlight this one for you here in the presentation, which is the number of permanent supportive housing placements made over the last three months. That was only six households, in fact, and that has everything to do with the limited number of permanent supportive housing placements that we have the capacity for in our system. So again, a metric we hope to see significantly increase with more stories like Dora's over the next um, three months and in future quarter reporting too. Um, next, length of homelessness helps us understand how long people are waiting for service in our community. And what we can see right now in the data is that um, for every person who gets helped into housing, they generally experience homelessness for about a year, whereas people who are still waiting for housing have generally been homeless for closer to two years. So that demonstrates, again, the need for our focus on prolonged homelessness, people who are stuck in long-term homelessness and why we need to design our programs to serve especially these households. And then finally, a brighter note in our system baseline metrics is returns to homelessness. And this um, metric, I believe, demonstrates that, if you can forward it, please, Clerk Moss. Um, this um, one demonstrates that when we house people, it works. Housing sticks. That, in fact, 95% of our participants don't return to our system of homeless services. Only 5% return. And that is a very, very successful um, retention rate that we will look to sustaining with increased capacity in the system. Okay, that's a lot of data, but hopefully that will start to kind of help formulate how we measure the impact of our work. Next slide, please. So each quarterly report must also include a financial report. And I am not gonna go through all these detailed numbers with you, but um, just at a high level, you see that our budget is based on the projected $38 million that Metro anticipated early on. We actually think that, that the newest uh, projection is uh, 52 million, but this reflects our current budget that we're working off of with um, a program planning. <clears throat> So far, we've seen one, we've received one million of those dollars, those new tax dollars. That's pretty much exactly as expected because of the way a new tax um, is collected uh, and a new tax of these sorts, the business tax and the income tax. So we expect the vast majority of the projected revenue to be received in the last quarter of uh, this fiscal year. And that is why the interim fund loan that you approved this spring has made all the difference so that we can build and launch this program according to the capacity that we will know, we know it needs to scale to be. Um, and so you can see the various program, programmatic investments, the different buckets of our services and how those have been budgeted and allocated so far and how much money is actually out the door so far. Um, and then at the um, bottom table, just quickly referencing that um, we are being very fiscally responsible with our reserving to anticipate economic downturns or any programmatic um, emergencies and setting aside those reserves as needed for the long-term investment of this program. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and I just wanted to take a moment to give you a sense of scale because um, this program, again, represents significant growth over the next um, three to five years in our SH, in our homeless and housing services funding. The baseline pie chart represents sort of annually how much we've received from the federal government, the state funding um, sources, and our general fund and our safety levy in the gray um, pie. And then you can see the second pie chart demonstrating the expansion of COVID. And you all are familiar with how much how challenging it has been to get $8 million out the door of expanded federal resources because we've had a limited system for implementing this work. And that is why it's so important that we're building a very strong foundation to anticipate significantly more growth in coming years with the SHS program. So this is just a quick sense of scale of what we're anticipating in growth with this new funding source. 
Next slide. Um, and I'm going to hurry on because I think I've um, stayed longer than I meant to in this um, presentation time. So uh, just very quickly, this is some work already underway for our second quarter. We've got um, funding opportunities uh, posted now for permanent supportive housing programs in those affordable housing projects um, that Shannon was presenting to you, the 1,472 units under development in Washington County. We hope many of those set aside units for supportive housing. So we got some funding opportunities for those partners to consider, as well as the operations, the permanent supportive housing program at Aloha Inn, which we're anticipating to uh, open this spring. We're also working to expand the role of the Homeless Plan Advisory Committee to include um, advisory body work of the over, uh, long term implementation of our supportive housing program. And then the next slide is just so important for us to mention. Uh, Next slide, please. The uh, winter shelter program. <clears throat> We are launching on Monday. Uh, we, we open winter shelter seasonally every, win uh, every winter from November 15th to March 15th. And this year that body of work has come under the supportive housing team. So they have been working very quickly to launch 187 shelter beds focused on life-saving um, shelter programs because of the emergence, the, because of winter weather conditions, but also using all of those new foundations of the housing case management program to help connect people to housing who are when they're staying in these shelter programs. So you'll hear more about that in coming weeks, but just a note that that is an important system expansion happening <laughs> starting Monday. Next slide. And I'm just going to wrap up just mentioning that tri-county coordination is also well underway. There's a full um, uh, list of these items of, of coordination, including that procurement that I mentioned and ARLA, the Long-Term Rent Assistance Program, and more. We are working in full partnership with um, Clackamas and Multnomah counties. They've been excellent partners to us uh, and Metro as well. And you'll hear more about the intergovernmental agreement in coming weeks. So just a note on tri-county coordination. And in closing of uh, this quarterly presentation, the next slide, please, just takes us back to Dora and the reminder of the programmatic goals, what all of this system and programmatic investment is about. Our goal to get to 500 supportive housing placements this year with an additional 500 households served with other kinds of housing interventions and that uh, sustaining those 100 new year round shelter beds that we've invested. And that's year one, but we continue to grow in years two and three to support a much bigger system um, uh, uh, to, to meet the needs of people like Dora in our community and permanently end homelessness. <laughs> 